touch with that. <laughs> Born in the United Kingdom, raised in Brooklyn, New York, and a graduate of Princeton University, Wentworth is an actor and screenwriter whose credits span both television and feature film. He's perhaps best known to many of you in one of two ways. Maybe it is for playing Michael Schofield on Fox's hit series, Prison Break, for which he received a Golden Globe nomination in 2006. But quite possibly, you know him for his viral Facebook post from earlier this year in which he opened up about his struggles with depression and suicidality throughout his life. Wentworth has become a powerful advocate for the mental health and LGBTQ communities channeling the celebrity into bringing conversations about these issues out of the darkness and into the minds and hearts of people around the world. In pursuit of these efforts, Wentworth has most recently been named an Active Minds Ambassador for Mental Health. It's for these and so many other reasons that I am honored tonight to recognize and celebrate Wentworth Miller with the Active Minds Hero. Back in 1990, when I first got to college, there was no active minds. And uh, to be honest, I don't think anyone would have acknowledged or admitted that there was a need for it. When I got to college, no one said, hey, it's okay to ask for help or, or change in the conversation about mental health. What they said was, you are now among the best and the brightest. And I heard that as a challenge. I heard that as a threat. To me, it sounded like the subtext was, if you're the best and the brightest, you shouldn't need help. And if you do, then maybe you don't qualify. I remember being really, really intimidated. Because everyone I met in my freshman fall, everyone seemed to have it all figured out. Everyone seemed to know exactly who they were and exactly what they wanted. Now, I've always known I was going to be a doctor. I've always known I was going to be a lawyer or a doctor and a lawyer, <laughs> and a chemical engineer on my weekends. I would hear that kind of thing or something like it, and I'd be like, wow, I don't, I don't even know if I want to get out of bed tomorrow. I don't even, I don't even know if I want to, to be here, like here, here. And that had been true for a long time. For me, depression started in childhood. I don't know if it was environmental, uh, environmental, chemical, hereditary, whatever the root cause, it went unrecognized and untreated. When I was 15, there was a very quiet but very real attempt to end my life, which I told no one about. And then a few years later, I was off to college, still depressed, still struggling, no support system in place, about to tackle a new and daunting set of challenges. Roommates, midterms, papers, finals, summer internships, drinking, dating, socializing, questions about identity, questions about sexuality, questions about the future and the threat of having to deal with more of all of that for four more years. 
Very quickly I felt outmatched, unprepared, totally overwhelmed. I started seeing a counselor for free for an hour once a week at the student health center because back then that's, that's what was on offer. If there were other resources available, support groups, peer-to-peer -peer counseling, if those existed, I didn't know about them. And the truth is, I was reluctant to ask. I didn't want anyone finding out what was really going on with me. I didn't want anyone finding out who I really was or believed myself to be broken, defective, not the best, not the brightest, not deserving of all these golden opportunities. I thought better to just keep quiet, just, just get along in pain and silence. And then one night, in the spring of my freshman year, I got as far as I could go. After the attempt, there was more pain, more silence. The school took official steps to ensure my safety, my continued enrollment, for which I was grateful. A few friends asked very polite, very awkward questions, then dropped it, for which I was also grateful. Because I didn't want to talk about it. I was, I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. It was like every negative thought I'd ever had about myself had just proven all of them to be true in front of an audience. The shame was real and toxic. And so was the stigma. Two days after my attempt, someone close to me someone whose opinion I valued, said, I have to love you less now to protect myself. And I thought, I get it. I understand. It's only fair. It's what I deserve. Their words haunted me, silenced me right through graduation and beyond. I have to love you less now. Almost 20 years later, that was the first line of dialogue in the first scene in the first feature film I ever wrote. I sold that script. That movie got made. And my career as a writer was launched. And in many ways, that was the beginning of me speaking my truth, of, of sharing my story with others, practicing and practicing and practicing <laughs> self-expression, getting whatever is inside of me, grief, fear, guilt, shame, rage, joy, out. Disguised as fiction, of course. <laughs> in the beginning, I needed fictional characters to speak for me, just like I did when I was acting, because I was afraid because speaking my truth was new for me, but it was a good start. It was good practice. Now it's five years later. I'm not writing screenplays anymore. These days I write about my life, my thoughts, my experiences, and I share all that online in a public forum where it's read by thousands of strangers. These days I stand in front of groups of people and I speak for myself, about myself, as myself. And it takes, it takes practice, still. And I'll tell you something else, this work, and it is, it is work, it's good work. It requires an enormous amount of trust. Trust in what I'm saying, trust I have the right to say it, trust that someone somewhere is listening and they know exactly what I'm talking about because they've been there too. By choosing to show up and tell my story, by choosing to be here, like here, here, I trust I'm making it easier for someone somewhere 
to tell their story and maybe add a few more chapters. I trust I'm being of service to others and myself because I know now that when I risk showing up as unlovable, that is how I show love. When I risk showing up as broken, that is how I am made whole. Sharing my story is and has been life-saving for me. And it's scary still. Because whenever I do it, whenever I write or talk about the things the younger me worked so hard for so long to keep quiet, whenever I find the courage to say, yes, me too, it's like, it's like opening a door and walking alone into a pitch black room and it's dark and I have to feel my way and it's frightening. And then I find the light switch and I turn on a light and I see I am surrounded. I see a room full of people. There are so many of us. I know that Active Minds has been around for a while now. It's approaching its 15-year anniversary, and I'd like to offer a really, really, really early and very sincere thanks, because that's a lot of students. That's a lot of students who've been reached, who've been made to understand that we all have our stuff. All of us, that sometimes getting out of bed in the morning can be just as worthy of praise and recognition as A's on a report card. That's a lot of young people who now know that you can struggle and fall down and ask for help and be the best and the brightest. That one does not negate the other. One facilitates the other. That is a noble effort. That is time and energy well spent. What you're doing here moves me. It inspires me. I'm humbled. I get to be a part of it. And I can't wait to see what's next. Thank you.